That'd be great too, yeah. but um, this year is just the sponge. <laughs> so maybe next year. All right. So, so sh these are our short-term missionaries. And so we have come today to dedicate and set apart this group of young people and their leaders for their service with Youth Works in Benton Harbor, Michigan. It is during this time that we commit them to God's care and protection and promise to uphold them with our prayers and our resources. Historical precedent for dedicating missionaries is given in Acts 13, verses 2 and 3. While, and you guys just had this in the one-year Bible. <laughs> While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. So to you candidates, you, to you those that are going, to the South Troy Church team, are you confident that your call to serve God and the people of this local congregation in Benton Harbor is from God? If you say, if you believe it is, say we are. we are. Do you agree to do the work set before you in such a way that it brings glory to Christ and his kingdom? If yes, say we do. We do. Understanding that accountability and acceptance of authority is clearly demonstrated for us in scripture, will you cheerfully come under the direction of those placed over you by the church? If yes, answer we will. With God's help, we will, seek you, see, will you seek to live your life in such a way as not to bring reproach to Christ or his church? If yes, answer, we will. We will. At this time, we invite all of you in South Troy Church to stand, please. And this is my address to you. This group has been chosen to answer God's call to serve as his representatives to the people of Benton Harbor, Michigan, for this time in their lives. In accepting this call, they are not only representing Christ and his church, they are representing you in South Troy as well. As they're sending church, I have some questions for you. Do you recognize that this group of young people and their leaders have been called by God to serve as his missionaries during this time of their lives? If yes, answer, we do. Amen. Do you commit to hold them in your prayers and support them with your resources as God leads? If yes, answer, we do. we do. Paul wrote these words to Timothy. 1 Timothy 4.12 says, Don't let anyone think less of you because you are young. Be an example to all the believers in what you say, in the way you live, in your love, in your faith, and in purity. And again, in 2 Timothy, Paul wrote, For this reason I remind you to fan into the flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of hands. For the Spirit God does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and discipline. I would like us all to pray together, especially for this team and for their coming week of ministry starting next Sunday. Dear Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to serve you in Benton Harbor, Michigan. We thank you for these young people and their leaders that are excited to go and ready to go and and, and Lord, they, they plan to have fun as well. It isn't just all work and no play, but Lord, they are going as well to serve and represent you and to, to be a blessing to the people that we're going to serve. And Lord, I pray that you will give each one strength, give each one all that they need and help them to be able to get be ready to go and help everything to, I'd like it to say to go smoothly, but I pray, Lord, that it will just go the way you have planned it. Lord, there's often going to be challenges, and I pray that you will give each one patience and grace to meet every challenge in a way that is pleasing to you. Lord, I pray also that you will stretch each one, that each one will just sense your, sense your presence, but also know that they need to rely on you for the work that you have called them to do. And Lord, we commit all this to you today. We pray for each one here and pray for these that are serving. We pray for our church and we thank you that they are going to pray for these people, these young people and their leaders this come, when they're gone. And I pray, Lord, that you will just hear our prayers and make their trip successful and safe and bring them home safely again in, on, uh, in two weeks. Thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Come on down. All right, we're going to be talking about looking forward. This is our kind of our vision Sunday. 
Um, what is stopping you? What is stopping you? What is holding you back? Bob Goff, a, a Christian leader, and he writes a lot of devotionals and books, he said, most of our decisions are driven by either love or fear. Whichever one has the keys determines how far you will go in your faith. We'll go in our faith. Have you ever realized, have you ever noticed, I'm sure we all have, that when you are running late, you will hit every single light. Oh, that was pretty poor. I mean, for me, it's almost every time. It's, all, it's a guarantee. Every Monday morning on my way to softball, I hit every light red, unless somehow I left early, which sadly doesn't happen as often as it could. So yeah, you hit every light red when you're late. It just seems to be inevitable. inevitable. Fear is like those red lights. Fear holds us back from what God wants us to do. Fear holds us back from what God has called us to do. Sometimes fear tells us that our future is too scary, that our bank account is too small, that our dreams are too big. Fear will keep us being satisfied without looking forward. Fear robs the world of some amazing things. It can even rob a church of its vision. It can tell us that we're better off playing it safe and concentrating on the business at hand and not venturing into the world or trying something new. One of the saddest things that fear robs us of is our imagination. We quit dreaming. We just settle. Mark Batterson wrote, God isn't offended by your biggest dreams or your boldest prayers. He is offended by anything less. If your prayers aren't impossible to you, they are insulting to God. Yet we often refuse to praise, pray those big prayers. We, we dream those dreams, and as we get older and as we believe that we're getting wiser, we think, ah, oh, we can't do that. Or we get to be that person that kind of squelches other people's dreams and says, oh, that's impossible. And we get to that place where we forget how to dream and we just, sat, we just settle for what things are going on and just taking it one day at a time and not really looking forward. King David had a dream. He had a vision of a work that God had sent him to do as the king of Israel. Once King David was firmly established in Israel as the king, he built this big palace for himself. And then he started to look around and he thought, God, you've given me this big palace. You have made me the king of Israel. Things are going pretty good. But God, you still live in a tent. We worship you in a tent. I want to build a beautiful temple for you. And I want to start, I'm going to pick that up in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 to 3. It says, when King David was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all the surrounding enemies, the king summoned Nathan the prophet. And look, David said, I am living in a beautiful cedar palace, but the ark of God is out there in a tent. And Nathan replied to the king, go ahead and do whatever you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. David's heart and desire were good. David wanted to build a temple for God. And there was nothing wrong with that dream. That was a great dream. That was a great plan because David had, you know, had gotten that far. So he told that to the, the prophet Nathan. And his desire was good, yet it wasn't meant to be. That night, Nathan got a dream, a vision from God. And God told Nathan, you need to tell David no. He's not going to build that temple. His son Solomon is. David had been fighting wars and he had enemies too long that, that God said, that isn't your place to be doing that. But it was a great dream and it isn't that the dream is gone, it's just that somebody else is going to complete it for you. And I love David's heart in this. It wasn't that David decided that, oh no, I, I mean, he didn't get mad, he didn't start pouting, he didn't just say, I'm not going to do anything about that, then forget it. Instead, he had the attitude of somebody that truly had the heart of God. And at the end of chapter 7, in verses 27 to 29, this is the end of David's prayer. 
He says, O Lord of heaven's armies, God of Israel, I have been bold enough to pray this prayer to you because you have revealed all this to your servant, saying, I will build a house for you, a dynasty of kings. For you are God, O sovereign Lord. Your words are truth, and you have promised these good things to your servant. And now, may it please you to bless the house of your servant so that it may continue forever before you. For you have spoken, and when you grant a blessing to your servant, O sovereign Lord, it is an eternal blessing. David prayed a big prayer. David had a big vision for the people of Israel. And he also had the promise from God that his family would be in charge. His family would be the kings of Israel for many, for up until the time of Jesus Christ, because Jesus came from the house of David. His family would always have a king on the throne. So David had an eternal promise of those kings coming up, but he wasn't to build the temple. So if you go with me, I want to show you 1 Chronicles chapter 22 and what David did in the meantime, waiting for Solomon to get old enough to, to be the next king. And in chapter 22, at the very first verse, it says, Then David said, This will be the location for the temple of the Lord and the place of the altar for Israel's burnt offerings. And in verses 3 and 4, he said, David provided large amounts of iron for the nails that would be needed for the doors and the gates and for the clamps. And he gave more bronze that can be weighed. He also provided immutable innumerable cedar logs for the men of Tyre and Sidon and brought vast amounts of cedar cedar materials for them up to David. And then David said, my son Solomon is still young and inexperienced and since the temple to be built for the Lord must be a magnificent structure, famous and glorious throughout the world, I will begin making preparations for it now. So David collected vast amounts of building materials before his death. David provided all these materials. He got everything ready, and he helped prepare everything for Solomon. You know, if you look down in verse 14 to 19, David said, I have worked hard to provide materials for the building of the temple of the Lord. Nearly 4,000 tons of gold. 40,000 tons of silver, and so much iron and bronze that it cannot be weighed. I have also gathered timber and stone for the walls, though you may need to add more. You have a large number of skilled stonemasons and carpenters and craftsmen of every kind. You have expert goldsmiths and silversmiths and workers of bronze and iron. Now begin the work, and may the Lord be with you. Then David ordered all the leaders of Israel to assist Solomon in this project. And the Lord, your God, is with you, he declared. He has given you peace with the surrounding nations. He has handed them over to me, and they are now subject to the Lord and his people. Now seek the Lord, your God, with all your heart and soul. Build the sanctuary of the Lord God so that you can bring the ark of the Lord's covenant and the holy vessels of God into the temple built to honor the Lord's name. David prepared, got everything ready for that temple for God, for his son Solomon. He planned it out, and he was celebrating that that would be made, that his dream, his vision would be completed, maybe not in his lifetime, but in the lifetime of his son. He had a vision of of what it would look like and what God had called him and the people of Israel to do. South Troy has a vision as well. South Troy was started by God with a lot of prayer and a lot of help and a bunch of impossible dreams. Today we are looking forward, but to do that well, we have to take a glance back and to see where we have come from and to see what that means for our church. Our vision at South Troy is to know, grow, and go with the love of Jesus Christ, making disciples with our 10 within our 10 zip codes that are represented here. For South Troy's vision to be healthy, first, a healthy vision has to come from God. A healthy vision has to come from God. Now, a lack of vision in a church doesn't mean the church is dead. They can continue to do the the ministry at hand, that people still come to know the Lord. People are still getting out there. 
yet they're missing out on the direction that God wants them to go. They are missing out on the plan that God has when they aren't look, following the vision that God has given them, when they're not looking forward. And it kind of cripples them for what, what is ahead that's hard to plan when you don't know where you're going. If you're just kind of floating along, you know, on a raft on a river, you don't really plan where you're going. You just kind of get there. But how do you know when you get there? Because you're just going along. And that's what happens when you don't have, have a vision. And if we don't have a vision, the plan will never be fulfilled. We might do good things, but we'll never be doing the best things. South Troy's vision, I said, is to know, grow, and go with Jesus' love. To be willing to welcome people just as they are. To be accepting. To, to share with them that God loves them. That we love them. That they're a part of something that God has called us to do in our journey. Jesus teaches us neither to condemn nor to condone sin. To, to be not judges, but to be physicians. To, to encourage people to come and to be a part of what God is doing. That's what it means when we say to love the sinner but we do need to stand up and be against, to, to hate the sin that, that surrounds us and tears people down and, and destroys people. And if we don't, and if we continue as we're growing, we need to have that direction so that we know who we're trying to reach and, and how to get out there. We must always offer grace and truth. God welcomes us just as we are into the family. And that's what South Troy desires to do as well, to welcome people just as they are, right where they are, so that they come to know Jesus. And Jesus is the one that'll, that'll change their lives if they, if they need that. Only God's grace, coupled with that, helps us to have lasting life change. God welcomes us just as we are. Our vision is to help each person to truly know Jesus. That's what Sunday mornings are all about, knowing Jesus, being introduced to who Jesus Christ is. That's how we've formed, that's what our Sunday mornings are for. Jesus are, gave us a mandate in Matthew 28, 20. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Teaching and discipling and becoming a student, all those things help us to grow our faith. It's to know and to grow. So we grow our faith by going to life groups, by studying God's word, by being involved in the local church, by serving. Often we learn best by serving others and by doing something with our faith to live it out as we grow. That's what we're called to do. And we believe that at South Troy Church. Without a, we also ask people to come along and join us on that journey. A church without vision is a little bit like a man that is handicapped, a person that is blind. You know, you're, you're blind, but you know, you can get along and you can do many, many amazing things as a blind person. Helen Keller showed us that life doesn't end when you're blind. And there is so much that we can do as a blind person, but you're still blind. You still never see the beautiful creation and the world around you in what it really looks like. And so as, as a church, if we don't have a vision, it's very much like that. We can experience a lot of things, but we're missing out on the direction that God has called us, and maybe we'll totally miss it all together. There's a, in Mark 8, the, the, Jesus healed a blind man, and you know sometimes we read the Bible and we think, ah, oh, that really didn't happen. I, this one is kind of gross, because when Mark 8, Jesus calls a blind man to him and takes him out outside of town, and he heals him. But I don't know if you all remember how he heals him. But often we think, I think I grew up believing that he spit on his fingers and then he rubbed them on the guy's eyes. It says he spit in his eyes. They're gross, right? God, Jesus spit in the man's eyes. And then he said, you know, and then he, then he put his hands on him and then he said, what do you see? And the blind man said, well, I see people, but they're kind of walking around looking like trees, you know? And Jesus touched him again. And the next time he opened his eyes, he, could, he saw more clearly. Now, did Jesus really not finish the, the miracle the first time? Or, or maybe was it that man's perception? Maybe he, because you remember, he had never saw before. He had a perception of what trees look like. He had a perception of what people look like. 
It's kind of like when I read a book. I love to read. And then when the movie comes out, it's nothing like the book. I mean, the characters look wrong. What they're doing doesn't... I mean, my imagination is so much better than those books, than the movies. <laughs> and that's what happens. Sometimes our perception is one way. We think we see things clearly, and yet we're missing out because we truly aren't seeing them the way God wants us to see them. Too often we get confused between the mission of the church, that all churches have, and the specific vision that Christ has for individual churches. The, the mission that all believers in all churches have is Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Therefore, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit teaching these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Have we got a vision for where God wants us to take South Troy? Do we know where we're going? Have we got a vision for our spiritual growth as individuals and as a church? Have you got a vision for where God wants you to be in the next five years? Do you have a vision for where you think South Troy should be in the next five years? Remember, we said that the beginning of the year, you in five years, and, and we talked a lot about that. And I'll have you know, if you were here and attend on those times, I'm up to 50 sit-ups. And I couldn't even do two back then, so I'm feeling pretty good. I'm still working at it. My goal is still 100, but it took time to get from getting hurt every time I started, so... It's really cool. So it works. But healthy vision is personal. It's personal for the church. Every church's vision is going to, their vision will be a little bit different. The vision that God has for South Troy is different than the vision for other churches in our community. It's different than because of the demographics. It's different because of the personnel. It's different because of the property, the staffing. There's a lot of things that God hasn't called us to be or to do. For one reason, we, we're in the country. I have people say we're in the middle of nowhere, and I'm thinking there's a lot of more rural and middle of nowhere churches than this one. <laughs> but, we are, but we're here, and this is where God has placed us. Our facility is only so big. So there's some other you know, restrictions. So there's a number of things we think about as we continue to, to develop the vision and what God has called us to do. The vision that God gave Paul young Young Yi Cho in Korea, he utilizes a church of a million people. He has tens of thousands of volunteer lay assistants that reach South Korea. That's a huge church he has out there, and it's been, and it's very strong, evangelical, holy church. And they reach many millions and millions of people. The vision that he gave us 14 years ago with just Two kids, zero money in the bank account is a lot different than, than it would be for that church in South Korea. It doesn't matter if all the churches around here have a vision. They're all going to be a little different. Steve, Dine Steve McVeigh in our Dirt Roads Network um, is kind of a coach for all of us rural pastors, and he says, the only thing the same about ch rural churches is that they're all different because we're all in different locations, we're all different, all different kinds of people, and so every vision is different. The vision that South Troy gave to me continues to be formed and he continues to reveal it. God uses his people to implement vision in the growth of the church. Whether it was Moses who received the vision to get the people out of Egypt, or Joshua that had to take him into the promised land, or David who had to conquer and become king or Solomon, who built the temple. Each had a vision that God called them to do. And then there's Martin Luther and John Calvin and John Wesley had different visions as well, and God used them in different ways to grow the church. That vision is for each local church is going to be a little bit different. Healthy vision is perfect. If you go back, we think of that story again where, the, where Jesus, that blind man, saw the people walking around like trees. You know, was his vision perfect? Well, yes, it was. Jesus, when he heals people, he did it right. He didn't do it by half steps. He did it perfectly. That man had 20-20 vision when he was finished that day. 
he could actually see. He just, his perception needed some tweaking. And if we think about it, you know, that's what it looks like here sometimes. Sometimes we have an idea of what church should be. Sometimes maybe when you first came here, you were expecting something different. You know, maybe it was, you know, when we first came, it was a lot different. Um, when I first came, I always wore a dress. I always looked, my kids called them church clothes. Um, and, I, and the guy that um, kind of handed off the building to us, he said, yeah, when you go, you should wear a dress, you should be this. And yeah, you did okay. And I got all this critique online a couple of times. And, and, and I thought the more I looked around at our congregation and our community, I thought that doesn't fit us because I didn't want people to have to feel uncomfortable when they came to church, that they had to dress up to come to church. I love the question is, how, how should I dress? Can I, and I go, just come as you are. You know, that's been what we've been saying. Be, God doesn't care. He cares about your heart, not your outward appearance. So that was, we've, we, you know, looked at different things. You know, sometimes we think it's going to be all hymns and, and a long prayer and an hour service, an hour and a half, and, and every, every perception is a little different. And if you think it's different with 45 people on a Sunday morning, you know, each and every one of you have a different perception. And if we tried to do each and every one of yours perception, well, that would take, you know, six weeks right there just to do them differently every week. Imagine if you're a church of 400 or 4,000, how often there's no way that everybody's perception of what church is going to be the same. So maybe, you know, what we look at and the things that we're trying to do might not be what you're always thinking that church should be like. But we believe that God has called us to this time and this place to be this church and to continue to serve him in the ways that he has called us to serve. And we do hit opposition on occasion. We do have you know, um, opposing ideas, but we try to work together and to continue to serve the way that God has called us. That happened when we started the backpack program. I had a lot of people come alongside us and said, well, there's not really any poverty in Wabasha County. There's not any poverty at, in Plainview, Elgin, Millville. And I had that happen a lot. I mean, it, it was surpri surprised me at first because I thought, well, don't you know that there's that's everywhere? But that these kids really are hungry. On, there are kids going home without any food on weekends. So that was, you know, a, one of our parishioners came to me and said, we need to start this. And she helped to get it off the ground, and we got it going. And, and, and God has been using that. And then... When we put the addition on, one of, our, one of our thoughts and one of our dreams was to add a food shelf. So that was, and I had that all argument again. Is there really a need? Do you think people are actually going to use that? And, you know, at first, we, our, our dream was kind of small at first. We were thinking maybe 10 people, you know, 10 different families a month, maybe 20. And I, we got the statistics. I have them right here. I forgot to put them in the sermon. Um, the food shelf currently served, last year, served 2,896 people, and we distributed 27,442 pounds of food. I would say there is a need for the food shelf in the area. And, you know, some days our volunteers might think other way. Sometimes, you know, they all seem to come one time, seems like, and then for a couple of times they won't be there. But there is a definite need. There is a definite bunch of people that come and, and receive help. And, you know, maybe that doesn't expand how many people are sitting in the pews, but that's not the point. The point that South Troy is trying to do is to serve the community, to show them Jesus' love. It doesn't mean that they have to go to our church. We pray that they'll find a church, that they'll be a part of a church. But the plan is that we are there to serve and to help, and that when they think of South Troy... They think of it as a place that loves them and welcomes them and that they're welcome to come. And even so, sometimes what we're doing might seem out there to, to, people, to us and even to people around us. We want to do what's necessary to reach people. Anything short of sin, we want to try to reach people for Jesus Christ, to share with them who Jesus is and how much he loves them. When we were ready to live stream 
you know, that was one of the dreams as well. We wanted to get live stream way before the pandemic hit. And so actually we were going, what, two Sundays before, I think, or at least one Sunday before they closed us. And we never really closed because we were online immediately that same next time. So God used that dream and that desire to get going, and, and we were able to get that taken care of. When we launched Celebrate Recovery in October of 2022, we were, were the only church within 20, out, 20 miles to offer that ministry. That first night, I prayed really hard because I thought maybe it was just going to be the three volunteers sitting there all night. We had seven people the very first night. And to us, we figured the most we would ever have is 10 to 15 because we're in a rural area, a small area. And now, last Sunday night, we had 26. And true, a number of them come from the Teen Challenge in Rochester. But those ladies are so blessed. We have a number of those ladies. One of them last week shared. She goes, and she hasn't missed her. And some of you met her. She came to our game nights, the, t um, the tall black gal. And she was so thrilled. She said, I can't miss a Sunday night. This is my place to worship. I need to be here on Sunday nights. She's going to be, you could be praying for her. She has to, she's getting out. She's, she's going to start having, you know, get her kids back and, and have a family. And, but she can't live here because she can't find a place to live in Rochester, that where she can have her kids. So she has to go up to St. Paul. So be praying for her if you think about her, because she goes, if I was, could stay in Rochester, I would. I would love to be here. But there's just not enough sober homes for people with kids. It's a, it's a stretch. So that's, you know, but those people, those people, I hate saying them like that. The, the, the people that are coming on Sunday nights really are blessed. They love, they love it that people cook for them, that um, they love being here, and they love worshiping. And you know, that's my night to worship too. I don't have to, I'm not up here very often. I teach a lot of it, but I'm also, I get to sing with them and boy, they have a lot of fun. And it's fun to sing with them and enjoy being with these people, be with, be with the people that are here. And that started just because we decided to have Minnesota Teen Adult Challenge come and start ministering to us once a year, starting in 2017. Other things we have tried and we're currently doing, we're going to have our second ice cream social coming up in a few weeks, in the end of August. You know, you might say, I want church to be comfortable. I like it just the way it is, and I don't like change. But maybe we need to change to reach more people. Maybe there's something we need to do. We, we have to be thinking outside of the box. But, you know, as we continue to grow and as we things, I want to kind of look at, we had a kind of a group got together February of 2018 that sat down in the basement. That was before the addition. I think it might have been 2017, actually. And we got together with, I don't know, about a dozen people got together and did some dreaming. And we put them up on, bo on big sheets of paper. And one of our, these were our goals, to have, see 100 people gather each week, to see new people come to our church and meet Jesus to have a children's ministry with 30 kids, to have our youth, grow by, youth group grow by 10%, to install strong, small groups that will help people become strong disciples and become financially healthy. Well, we're still working on the list. <laughs> we're not quite there yet, but we're way closer than we were. If we wouldn't have had those two years of the pandemic, we might have made it through there a little bit quicker, but things kind of shut down in a couple of years. But they're great goals, and they're great for our future vision to include. And with those goals, we raised the money for the addition. And that was amazing. And, we, and it was built by December, December of 2018. We were dedicating the addition. God moved, and God, that's on my piece of paper from July of 2010. That vision for the addition was there from the very beginning. And God used that. Now what we continue to do in our goals for the addition, which we've kind of say, already shared, we serve the school district through the Backpack for Food program. We opened a food shelf. We're available for the community to use for township meetings, for voting, for funerals, weddings, potlucks, children and youth ministry. We have a place where we can have Celebrate Recovery. We were able to upgrade the sanctuary. And we've added... 
And one of our other goals was to add a second service, possibly Hispanic service. Of that list, all of them are done but the last one. And if you count Celebrate Recovery, we did add a second service. Now we're at our 12th year here at South Troy. We've come a long way, but we're not done yet. We have so much to do, so many people yet to reach. In the next five years, what do you see South Troy like? What do you see happening in South Troy in the next five years, the next 10 years? I see the steeple repaired, and it didn't leak this last two weeks. Isn't that awesome? It could have. The basement did. <laughs> but but that, that God answered that prayer. In a year of fundraising, and it's taken care of. God provided the everything, and he's just awesome. I see families on Sunday mornings that need to know, grow, and go. I see young leaders emerging and taking active roles in ministry, obeying the call that God has placed on their hearts. I see people coming to know and grow with Jesus. And by putting, and I see us putting up campus in, in Rochester eventually and, and allowing our launchable leader, Jenny Hu, to be, be ready to have, her, have a church that she'll be leading as well, probably sooner than later, the way it's going. She's been going through a program to become a launch of a leader from South Troy to plant a church. And um, hopefully a Hispanic service in the near future as well, an Elgin or, or another service here at, Roch, at, at South Troy. I see teens and children finding hope and help by attending Celebrate Recovery with their parents and their family. And I see the Little Red Schoolhouse active and in use for children and their families, for those that need a, need a safe place to grow and get to know Jesus, to be a kid. We are dreaming big dreams here at South Troy, and we want to follow God in the years ahead. God loves it when we think outside the box and look forward. I don't want our vision for South Troy to be too small. I don't think it can be too small. Not everything we've tried worked. A lot of you have been here through some of those things that crashed and burned. You know what? That's okay. God didn't say they had to all work. He just says to keep going. He didn't say they all would work either, so we just keep trying. When we started fundraising for the mission trip, the students thought it was going to be too big of a goal. And now we're going with a little bit left over. It's all taken care of. That's awesome. A lot of that is a thanks to you because of the the pasta dinner and dessert and the auction, silent auction that we had. God is very good. When we reopened South Troy and began working on the building, we had zero in the bank account and needed $10,000. And people just started giving. Crane Chapel and a number of other people in the community provided for us. We just continued to trust God for the rest. In the movie Cabrini, some of you saw that, and um, that little nun, somebody asks her, how are you going to fund this? And she says, you begin the mission, the means will come. Now, I know, don't, I, I know that we aren't just supposed to build things and expect them to come. That's not the point. This is something a little bit different. I want you to see it, hear it for yourself on the video clip that we have. You think you're going to march in here and help me? I want the best hospital for your people and for mine. Begin the mission and the means will come. What kind of New York do we want? You have to watch the movie to get a better picture. <laughs> that was the best I could do. And there's a South Troy timeline that I want to show you just to show you how South Troy has evolved since we've been here. Or since the 50s, actually, so. Sure, there it goes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thanks, Eric. <laughs> so how is your spiritual vision? Jesus told us in Matthew 6, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. I believe God's plan for South Troy is not over. I believe God's plan for South Troy is for each of us to be a part of his future for his church at South Troy. Our vision 
to know, grow, and go, and our mission remain the same. South Troy is here to help bring people, those that don't know him, that don't, don't really have any idea what church is about, to know, grow, and go with Jesus' love. The work remains. There are hundreds of people around us that don't know Jesus Christ. There are thousands of people in our county that don't know Jesus Christ. There are millions of people in this world that don't know Jesus Christ. Let's start here. Let's start now to follow Jesus and his mission here at South Troy. For an, and I pray that it will last for another 100 years or until Jesus Christ comes back, whichever comes first. I want this church to be continually serving him. That's my vision. That's God's vision for South Troy. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, you are so good. You have been so good to us. You have used South Troy to, to reach hearts and to reach lives, to change lives. Many have come to know Christ here. Many continue to grow in their faith. And, and Lord, we heard from Ben a few weeks ago how he has grown in his faith since he started coming. And, and like I said, Nye and some others have just been such a blessing to me. And then to know our, those that are like our youth group going out and serving, Father God, that is growth. That is amazing. That is you. And we are very thankful that you have chosen us to be a part of your kingdom, to be part of your family, to choose this church to, to be a part of, the, of changing Southeast Minnesota, of being a part that reaches people here. Lord, help us to be faithful. We pray that you will find us faithful that you will send us to do the work you have called us to do. And we pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Would you stand with us as we sing, Send Me.